فتوبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لربهم فرجة وقياما والذين يقولون رب نصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين uh, First and foremost I'd like to thank uh, the masjid uh, ELM has been a place that is very close to my heart as a matter of fact uh, I like coming here without telling anyone often um, and I've conducted some social experiments here as well. So I was here a few months ago. I think I mentioned this before, but I, I came here a few months ago uh, to attend Jumu'ah. I was in the audience. I kept a hoodie on so nobody would know who I was. And I kept my head down and I wanted to see if I would get caught. And I didn't. I actually survived the entire experience. One guy in one of the rows during Jumu'ah kind of did a side view and I quickly, you know, did uh, did better hijab basically and then it was fine <laughs> but regardless uh, the, the hospitality that's been extended to me and of course the overwhelming uh, number of you that have come tonight is an indication of the love Allah has put between us and may Allah Azza wa Jal accept that love itself as an act of ibadah um, and only increase that between the Muslims um, what I wanted to share with you this evening is uh, something that a, a passage of the Quran at the end of Surah Al Furqan, this is the 25th Surah of the Quran. Uh, it's a passage that's very near and dear to my heart. It's something I've talked about many times before, but every few years I feel the need to go back and refresh my relationship with these ayat. And if I feel that need, I feel it's something that you would need as well. And so that's that's the inspiration between, between uh, or behind sharing some of these reflections from the end of Surah number 25 with you. Allah Azza wa Jal in this passage uh, gives us people a special title. And that title is Wa'ibadur Rahman, the slaves of the incredibly merciful, the incredibly loving. Believers can be called the slaves of Allah. The believers can be called simply the believers. We can be called the Muslims. We have many titles. And of all of those titles, a special, unique title that Allah has chosen in this surah is Ibadur Rahman. And that's an indication of something. First and foremost, from a grammatical point of view, Ibadur Rahman is what they call in Arabic an idafa. What that simply means is two words that are bonded with each other. Grammatically, two words that are fused with each other. And grammatically, you say even that nothing comes between the mudaf and its mudaf. They're, 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 they're inseparable. And using that kind of structure in and of itself, because you could say Ibadun lil Rahman also, slaves to Ar Rahman. But the fact that those, those two words have been fused together itself, some uh, you know, commentators were led to be inspired by the fact that this is describing a very close relationship with certain people and Allah. And the names of Allah, of course, each of them has a certain connotation. It brings about certain emotions for any one of us. He could have said, Ibadullah, the slaves of Allah. But he chose in his wisdom to say, Ibad ar-Rahman. And so the relationship that is being described between us and Allah in this ayah is one of love, care, and mercy. We have been brought into the folds of Allah's love, care, and mercy. And as the ayat go, there are two ways, two distinct ways of looking at what's been said. One way of looking at it, there are going to be certain qualities of people. Who are these special people that Allah calls Ibadur Rahman? And one way of looking at it is, well, here's a list of these qualities, and until you have all of them, you have failed. That's one way of looking at it, isn't it? And so, and for, for many of us, we're just going to look at the first one and say, okay, well, I already disqualified. But another very clear way of looking at it, which is extremely plausible in the Arabic of these ayat, 
is that each one of these are a separate group of people. Each one of them is a separate group of people. What they have in common is that they're all believers. But the thing about it is, and this is the point that I want to give you in my introduction, we're not all the same. Some of you, like I met a woman this, this afternoon after Jumu'ah, she came up to me and said, I make tahajjud three hours every day. Is that okay? That's what, literally what she asked me, is that okay? And I said, you should get some kind of award because <laughs> tahajjud for five minutes is impossible for people. They haven't got, you know, people getting up for fajr on time is incredibly hard sometimes. And this woman is doing three hours and I said, what makes you do that? And she says, well, you know, what am I going to do? Watch TV? I'd rather talk to Allah. You know, that's what she says to me. And I was honored that she came to ask me. I should be, you know, seeking her advice for people that are that close to Allah Azza wa What I'm trying to get at is, we're not all the same. I can't do what she does. I'll be honest with you. I'm not capable of doing what that woman does. And I admire the ability Allah has given her. May Allah continue to give her istiqamah and answer her prayers. But you know, there are other people who are just amazing at helping others. Their skill, their gift is to be able to help somebody else. There are yet other people who just have one effect. When they're around people, they feel better. That's their gift. You just go to them, even if they don't say a word, you're just hanging around them and you just you feel like there's a calm in you, there's a peace in you. Allah has given all of us different gifts. This passage, one of the ways that I personally find that far more convincing is highlighting different things about different believers. So each, there's a group of believers that has one special quality. Another group of believers has, has another special quality. That's what makes them special. And as we go through these ayat, you might find, well, I don't fit in the first one. I don't fit, I hope I make it into at least one category here. And inshallah ta'ala, as you will see, you will. You may even make it into more than one category. And that qualifies you to be Ibad rahman May Allah include all of us among his Ibad rahman So the first of them, it's fascinating. The first, you would think if Allah is talking about that are the closest to him, that he loves the most, perhaps you should begin with those that pray the most to him that worship him the most, you know, that, that are most diligent in their spirituality towards Allah, where does Allah begin? He says, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا The sl special merciful, or the, the slaves of the especially merciful, these special people are ones who walk on the earth with humility. الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا Before we go any further, we need to understand what that means. It does not mean that when you walk on the street, you walk half in ruku or like your shoulders are drooping down and you're, you know, I'm being humble. That's not humility. You walk upright. Humility means that you don't treat people like they're less than you. You don't talk down to people. And the idea of fil ard is actually wherever you go, whether you're at home, whether you're at work, whether you're at school, whether you're dealing with your employees or you're dealing with your employer, whether you're dealing with children or you're dealing with elders, whether it's your parents, whether it's somebody else, whether it's Muslims or non-Muslims, when you deal with people, there's a certain humility in how you deal with them. You don't feel, make anybody feel worthless. With your words, with the way you look at them, with the way you carry yourself. This is al-mashi al al-ardi hawnan, walking on the earth with humility, in a, in a humble fashion. You see, the Qur'an will highlight different kinds of arrogance. Now, everybody here knows arrogance is a disease of the heart. It's inside the heart, yes? But then, when there's a disease inside, like a virus is inside, there are symptoms on the outside. There's high temperature, there's sweating, there's all this kind of stuff. The Qur'an will highlight what are some symptoms of arrogance. Allah will describe, for instance, the way people stare at someone. Just the way they look at him. They will describe how the Qur'an will say, that there are people who stare at the Prophet they, they stare at you so hard, you might almost slip and fall by the way they're looking at you. That's how hard they stare at you. In other words, they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything, their arrogance was where? Just on their face, just in their eyes. So for a lot of young people especially, this is an advice to you, your parents are yelling at you about something fair, unfair, doesn't even matter. And you're sitting there listening, and your blood is boiling, 
and you want to yell back, but you just stare at them with this ugly look. This ugly look you give them. And your, your mother says, why are you looking at me like that? And, she said, and you say, well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> you don't get an award because you didn't say anything. Because the arrogance wasn't just in your words. Congratulations, you didn't say anything. That's good. Because <laughs> that would have been far worse. But there's pride and anger and a lack of humility even in our face. Even in the way, you know, ثم نظر, ثم عبس وبصر, ثم أدبر واستكبر. Just the way you stare at someone, just the way you frown, just the way you roll your eyes. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's the way you look at someone, sometimes it's the way you don't look at someone. Somebody said salam to you, you didn't even look at them. You just looked the other way, like you ignored it. Or you said wa alaykum as salam, especially, you said wa alaykum as salam because you feel guilty, but you said it in an especially low voice to make sure they don't hear it and they feel like you didn't respond. So it's like Allah knows I said it, but I don't want them to have the satisfaction of knowing that I responded to their salam. So when they come and say, hey, I said salam, you didn't respond, I did say it. You know? <laughs> That's some special kind of, of lack of hawn. Humility towards people. Mercy towards children. Mercy towards elders. Mercy towards people that are not worthy of it. They're not worthy of it. And this doesn't mean, by the way, at the same time, this does not mean you let people walk all over you. There are situations in our families, among your friends, in your circles, of people that are very abusive. It happens. There are people in your family, maybe sometimes your parents even, that say very hurtful things, that say very unfair things. And you have to hear it all the time, over and over and over again. There are women in our audience that I can't see. They're somewhere in this zip, zip code or postcode. But wherever they are, maybe they have to hear things from their in-laws or their siblings or somebody else. And they have to hear it all the time and it boils their blood. What do you do then? Well, you still have to retain your humility. What you have to learn to do is one, Stay out of those situations. If you know you're going to lose your cool, walk away. I can't be part of this conversation right now. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go take a walk. Just get away from it before you explode. This is first and foremost, yamshuna ala al-ardi hawnan. And then logically what's connected to it incredibly in the Quran is وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا It's piece by piece some incredible lessons here. Ida, in the Arabic language, doesn't mean if, it means when. When obnoxious people, when people that don't possess control talk to them, when ignorant people talk to them, it doesn't say if they talk to them, the ayah says when they talk to them. Allah is letting you and me know there are going to be people that address us, that engage us in conversation, that communicate with us, that are not going to be nice. That's going to happen. You cannot avoid it. That kind of unpleasant experience is going to happen to each and every one of you, including myself. There are going to be those that are jahil. Now understand what jahil means. Jahil doesn't just mean somebody who's ignorant. You know, when Musa alayhi salam was asked you know, about the cow, you know, they, they, and he said, you should slaughter a cow. And they said, are you kidding? Huzwa, you take us for a joke? We're going to slaughter a cow? We have a serious situation here. We don't need to slaughter no cow. He got really upset. And you know what Musa alayhi salam, when he gets upset, he could do stuff. <laughs> you know. So he immediately turns to Allah and says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ I seek Allah's refuge from becoming people who are jahil, among people who are jahil. That doesn't mean ignorant, because obviously Musa is one of the most knowledgeable people ever, that ever lived. He's not talking about ignorance. He's saying, I'm asking Allah's refuge from losing control over my emotions from losing control over my temper, from saying things or doing things that I really want to do right now, but I need to hold myself back. Now with that understanding, come back to the ayah. There are people who have, who just say the most horrible things and they have no breaks. You know, there's supposed to be, there's, there's something in your heart and something in your mind, and it's supposed to travel down to your tongue. But on the way, there's supposed to be some breaks. Maybe this shouldn't come out of my mouth. I'm feeling something. Bad words are coming, they've reached all the way here, but they shouldn't come out of my throat. They should go back and swallow them. You know, you should get... But there are some people, whatever comes in their head, they say it. You come and say, meet somebody after six months at a party, at Eid or something. Hey, Sarko, you got fat. In front of everybody. This guy. 
What a horrible thing. Fine, you can think it. And just say, mashallah, in your head. But why you got to say it in front of everybody? You know? Hey, I, you know, so you dropped out of school a few years ago. You're still not graduated? Still a dropout? You know? They say things to you like that, and it upsets you. You know, what do you do in those situations? Allah Azza wa says, and this is part of your humility and mine. This is how Allah will check our humility. People will come and say and do the most offensive things. And by the way, a lot of times, those are the people that are the closest to us. Which means you get thrown in that situation over and over and over and over again. Like, how do you get out of it? Allah says, إِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا this means a couple of things. I'll just share a few of these lessons here. When this happens, your immediate response should be peace. Qalu salaman could also mean farewell. They say, peace. I don't want any more of this conversation. I'm going to leave you in a dignified fashion. Oh, wait, I think I have an appointment. And you could say in your head the rest of it, with Allah, to make dua. <laughs> but you don't have to let them know. Just say, I have an appointment and just get out of there. Because you, you can't handle it. In other words, they walk away from it in a dignified fashion. That's one meaning. When obnoxious people come to you, find a way of, you know, what Quran will later in the surah say, marru kiraman, they pass by it in a dignified fashion. Another is when people are coming and trying to, there are some people who try to say things to get you angry. They actually enjoy doing that. They'll say things just to provoke you. And, they, and some of them know exactly what to say because they've been in conversation with you before and they know what sets you off, so they know exactly what buttons to press and get under your skin. And you're sitting there, not this time, not this time, not this time, and then you're the Incredible Hulk and everything's going to be destroyed. You know? And when that happens, you need to diffuse it before, listen, I don't want to be in... You know, you can actually speak up and say, say something that declares, look, I don't want this conflict. I want this, this conflict. Let's have a peaceful dinner. Let's not talk about that today. And insist on it. This can also be qalu salaman. I don't mean to fight with you. I just rather just you know have this conversation and not let it go down an ugly path. In other words, sometimes we don't say anything, and people keep walking all over us. In the ayah, there's actually an indication, perhaps, that you can, in a dignified way, in a respectable way, and in a confident way, let people know they need to back off. They're going too far. It's not right. That's not disrespectful. That's not a lack of adab. You can stand up for yourself, but you just have to do it in a dignified way, in a way that is peaceful. Also, Salam and some have looked at even as a state. In other words, when they respond, they are completely at peace. That's another implication here. When obnoxious people are talking to you, they're getting under your skin, they're making you upset, they're saying lie after lie after lie, and you have to sit there and listen to it like it's true. And they're saying it in front of other people too. You're being thrown under the bus for no reason. When you respond, whatever your response is, it better be calm. You need to be calm and collected when you're responding. This is qalu salaman. And to Allah, people who can accomplish that in life, special to him. Ibadur Rahman. In other words, this motivation, we need to remember. At that time, the person you're talking to does not deserve your calmness. They don't. Actually, they may deserve a punch in the face. At the, at the moment, you have so much, you're so good at comebacks. Some of you, when somebody says something sarcastic to you, you can crush them. Oh my God, the answers that come in your head. It's a multiple list that plays in your head. Should I go with A, B, C, or all of the above? You know, that's what's going on in your head. And at that time, when you decide to back off, what motivation can you and I have to have the strength to not say, to not react, to remain calm? I want to be counted among Ibad rahman I'm going to forget that I'm in this unpleasant conversation. Because right now, immediately right now, I am in the company of Allah and His special rahmah is descending on me. That is why He put me in this situation, so I can earn closeness to Him. This is actually a blessing. This unpleasant gathering is actually a blessing for me to get to Him. Subhanallah. عِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Look at what Allah says next. The second group of people, this is their special quality. By the way, this doesn't mean they don't do anything else. Like they don't pray and they don't eat halal. And that's all covered. You're already ibad. This is above and beyond being ibad, yes? What's the second great quality, second group of people that are special to Allah? What reason makes them special? يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا Those who spend their night 
before their master in sajda and standing. They're praying in the middle of the night where nobody sees them. They can't sleep and they know Allah is closest to them in the middle of the night and that's what they do. For a lot of us that's very difficult. And by the way, you would imagine, like I told you before, if Allah was talking to the people that are closest to Him, I expected Him to begin with this group. I expected Allah will tell me about the people that pray to Him the most, especially at an hour that is the closest to Him, which is in the middle of the night. We should start there. But no, He didn't start there. He started with humility. Because that act at night, when you, you and I are humble before Allah, there's no chance of anybody else seeing us pray. There's nobody to impress. The only one you want to impress is Allah. Your pride is gone. Your sense of self-worth is gone. You're, you're in front of Allah admitting everything you've done wrong. You're having an open conversation before Allah, completely stripped of all of your pride. Allah Azza wa is teaching us something profound. If you want to strip yourself of your pride, first step actually, is to see if you can get rid of your pride before people. And then come before Allah. You know, there are people who are great in worship, and yet really mean to people. It doesn't work that way. There, were some, there was a group that was given a priority here, and those were the ones that are humble to people. And then of course, those who come before Allah in humility, this is not something easy to accomplish, but if once in a week, once in a week, I know this is gonna be hard, but once in a week, you pray Isha at the masjid, and you go straight home, and you go to sleep. And that will only happen if you woke up super early and didn't sleep. So wake up for Fajr, don't sleep. Exhaust yourself, pray Isha, and go to sleep. And then set your alarm for maybe 45 minutes, half an hour before Fajr. I'm not asking for the entire night, it's okay. Half an hour before Fajr, just set the alarm. Get up, pray a couple of rakats. Just do that. And just take your time doing it. And don't wake anybody else up. Do it quietly. Go in some corner of the house. You know? And, and do it there. And if you can start doing it even one time, two times, what you will find, the peace you will find, the connection you will find with Allah, is something that will help you through the most difficult of times. And may, may Allah include us among these people, الَّذِينَ يَبِيتُونَ لِرَبِّهِمْ سُجَّدًا وَقِيَامًا then there's the third group of people. The third group of people are وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّ نَصْرِفْ عَنَّا عَذَابَ جَهَنَّمْ إِنَّا عَذَابَهَا كَانَ غَرَامًا إِنَّهَا سَاءَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا People who just make one dua. Not a whole long list of duas. Their only dua is, Ya Allah, I don't want to go to hell. It's just anything but Jahannam. Don't throw me in Jahannam. Keep us away from the punishment of Jahannam. It is a horrible place to be. I don't want to see it for one moment. I don't want to be there temporarily, and I don't want to be there long term. Listen to the dua carefully. <laughs> it's, it, first of all, its punishment is a huge penalty, and I don't want to be here, there temporarily, and I don't want to be there long term. There are some who develop the same disease among the ummah, among the Muslims, the same disease that Banu Israel had. They said, Allah will not punish us illa ayyam ma'duda, except a few days. Muslims developed this and said, well, Allah is going to punish, but not forever, right? We're Muslim, eventually we come out. I mean, yeah, okay, fine. I'm going to go to Jahannam, but it's going to be like a long weekend. And then, you know, I'll be fine. Look at the dua of people who are close to Allah. They're telling Allah, Ya Allah, I don't want to go to Jahannam. Not temporarily and not permanently. In, I'm recognizing that it's a horrible place to be, mustaqarran wa muqaman. A place to just stop over or to stay forever. I don't want either of those. This has many implications for us. I'll just highlight one for you. You see, you and I will never stop being tempted. Haram will always be in front of us. And it will call us. Ashaytanu ya'idukum wal faqr. Shaitan will promise you bankruptcy. In other words, when you go down the road of halal, Shaitan will promise you you're missing out. You're missing out. You're missing out. You could be having so much more fun. You could be making so much more money. You could be having so much more pleasure. He's constantly going to market to you alternative products, alternative ways of fulfilling yourself. It will never stop. It doesn't matter how long you grow your beard. It doesn't matter how much Quran you memorize. It doesn't matter how much tahajjud you pray. None of that will matter. Shaitan will not stop. You will still be human being at the end of the day. You will still have those desires at the end of the day. And Shaitan will not stop. He will keep going at you. And it is in those times that shaitan, 
you know, the, the tactic that Allah describes of him, the psychological tactic, is زَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Shaitan beautified their deeds to them. Shaitan will come to you and you're tempted to do something wrong. And you say, yes, it is wrong, but I also do a lot of good. Yeah, I did mess up, but I prayed too. You know, and it's not like I'm a kafir. So it's okay, I mean, this is just, and I'm going to stop after this time. It's not like I'm going to do it later. I'm just doing it this one time. You start telling yourself all of these rationalizations. You start justifying it to yourself. In your head, it's not that bad. And then of course you're around people who when you tell them, you know, this is wrong, they also tell you, no man, come on, it's not that bad. Stop, don't talk like that. No, Allah is not like that. Allah is not gonna, doesn't want to punish you. Why are you going to talk so depressing? You're so extreme. And then you listen to that and it starts impacting you and you start saying to yourself, yeah, okay, you know. But that, that, that time you did it, whatever you did, whether it was drugs or alcohol or whether it was something with someone, I don't want to know. But whatever that was, and you told yourself it's the last time, it wasn't. Because as soon as the last time and the guilt over a couple of days, then there's another text message. Then there's another da'wah. You know? And you're like, no, this is the last time. And you go through that cycle again. And you do it again. And you keep on going. This is exactly what shaitan wanted. These are people who can stop that cycle, turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, no matter what my friends are saying, no matter what waswasa is going in my head with shaitan, no matter how many times I've repeated this horrible cycle over and over again, I am done. I'm done feeling guilty for two days and then going back. I'm done apologizing to you and then going back. They don't insist on the sins they did and they know what they're doing. I'm not going to be from those people. Tawbah, repentance, doesn't work for those who keep on doing sins even after they make tawbah. It's not for those people who keep cycling back in. These are people who say, Ya Allah, I don't want to go to Jahannam. Fine, I've done some pretty Jahannam worthy things, but I'm going to stop now. And I'm done. These are special people to Allah. Because Allah knows how tempting it was. Allah knows how powerful the addiction was. Allah knows how deep into sin you were. Allah knows the hold of shaitan on you for, the, for so long. And you were able to break that hold and come back to Allah. Your journey to Allah is much tougher than other people's journey. The temptations in front of you are much stronger. The gravitational pull on you is harder. And you fought that and came back to Allah, you're special. Don't think, oh well, I don't pray tahajjud, so I'm not that good. <coughs> or I don't, have, I don't even know any Arabic. Or I haven't even read the whole Quran. And I don't even know tajweed. Or I don't need, no, 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 no. You're not special because you're not, you're, you're knowledgeable. Your, your specialty doesn't come because you've made Hajj 17 times. You're not special to Allah because of your ilm or your worship. You're special to Allah because you walked away from sin. And you were just afraid of hell. That, that's what makes you special to Allah. You're also Ibad wa Rahman. And so from there, Allah Azza wa Jal takes us in a completely different... Each of these groups, think about what applies to you. How do you want to be special to Allah? How do you want to get close to Allah? And how do I want to get close to Allah? What is it worth to us, really? At the end of the day, what is it worth to us? You know, some, there's, sin is a, is a kind of love. You fall in love with it. You get addicted to it. And this, is, this passage is really about a competition of love. Because you love this pleasure, and you love this sin, and you, can't, you don't want to let go because it'll make you sad. And on the other hand, Allah is saying, I will replace that fulfillment with myself. I'll replace it with my, my company Allah is offering you. And you have, to, you have to decide this equation for yourself. You're going to be put in that situation. And nobody, nobody will know that this struggle is happening in your head. Nobody will know. Only Allah will know. Only Allah will know. And by the way, when you're walking, some of you guys are, for example, in haram relationships. I don't know. I'm not accusing you. Some people, not you. Some people that you know. And you're in an inappropriate relationship. And you're trying to break it off. So you heard this talk and you texted her. I can't do this anymore. And she writes back, what do you do? You don't love me? Or you hate me now? 
Oh, you think I'm the reason you're going to go to hell? I'm so evil? And now you're like, no, you're not that evil. <laughs> no, but I, but I do love you. You're, you're not bad at all. You're, you're great. Um, okay, why don't you just, okay, fine. If you really want to end it with me, see me tonight and end it in my, to my face. No, I can't do that. Fine, you hate me. Okay, fine, I'm coming. <laughs> and it starts over again. And then you want to do Toba later on. You see? It's not just you. You might even get emotionally sucked into something. And now you're being emotionally blackmailed. You're making me to feel bad. You have to fight that. You have to overcome it. And you have to recognize that you might disappoint someone, but you're making Allah happy. And you're doing that not just for yourself, you're also doing it for the, other, for the girl who's texting you back, or the guy who's texting you back. You don't want them standing in front of Allah also. You just save them too. If you really love them, didn't just lust them, but you love them, then you want to save them too. This is for them also. You understand that? So now, from here, we go to a very unexpected place. Who else is special to Allah? Those people who when they spend, meaning when they spend money, they don't blow all the cash they have, they don't overspend, and they're not cheap either. They don't spend too much, and they don't spend too little. They have a balanced budget. What does a budget have to do with getting close to Allah? It does. The way you spend your money, because your mal, وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ مَعْلُومٌ In their money, there's rights that are known. Your parents deserve financial support, your children do, your siblings do, your spouse does. Sadaqa. There are, your money should go and help. And this is, there are causes that deserve your, your finances. But when you become addicted to things that are useless, and your money keeps going into movie after movie after movie, subscription after subscription, game after game after game, you know, new, new gadgets for your car. You, you don't need rims that spin backwards. You don't need them. But you need them to, for somebody else. You can't look at them when you're driving. Somebody else is looking at them. They're spinning for someone else, not you. <laughs> you know, or the spoiler, or the gadget. You know, you'll survive without the new iPhone. You'll be fine. You know, the Samsung, a little dangerous, but you know, regardless. <laughs> But when you keep on spending, and you, and you, you know, for, for a lot of sisters, it's a purse or a bag. God, some of these bags, they're like thousands of pounds, you know. I'm not saying you can't have any of it. But Allah does say, okay, spend, but don't overspend. And for some of you, the, the greatest joy is holding on to money. The wife says, you're going to groceries with your wife. She puts a carton of milk in it. We need this much milk? Can you get the smaller milk? Can we wait till there's a, there's a sale? <laughs> this milk. <laughs> it's eggs. Can you not be cheap with that? There are people who hold back from the, the ones they deserve, from the ones who deserve. Your children deserve some money. They need some, some change, something to, you know, to, to get by. Your wife deserves some money. If she's taking care of the household and she's not working, and she asks you, I need, you know, can I have, you know, 50? What do you need it for? Give me a complete report. Show me all the receipts. Wait, <laughs> hold on a second. This is lam yaqturu. That might be your challenge. You want to get close to Allah. Don't make your family feel like garbage every time they, they, you know, they eat something. The best money you can spend is on your family. Don't do that to your family. But don't overspend either. There are others who are just blowing cash and you know, Allah has given you a little bit of wealth and you're getting your your 16-year-old, a BMW that they can crash into the side of a street and then you get them another one and... No, no, you can't do that either. There are people who have a balanced approach to their finances. لَمْ يُسْرِفُوا وَلَمْ يَقْتُرُوا وَكَانَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ قَوَامًا And they find an upright, balanced way to stay in between those two and those are beloved to Allah. May Allah make us of them. This is my favorite one. The next group. Listen to this. It's all one group. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ فَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ إِلْقَاءَ أَثَامًا 
those who don't call other, along with Allah any other God. And while they don't call any other God besides Allah, they don't kill anyone. And they don't commit adultery. Three things. They don't worship anyone other than Allah. They don't call on anyone other than Allah. Combined with it, they don't commit murder. And they don't commit adultery. Three things together. That's not an amazing accomplishment. Somebody could say, um, hey, made it on the list. I haven't killed anyone. <laughs> you know. But you know why this is special? Because this seems like very basic, doesn't it? Those are major sins. And Allah says, you can be special before Allah if you just do this. Why is this special? For some people. Think about the people in Mecca. Think about the society in which the Quran came. Those people were doing shit for thousands of years. Murder became common among them. Zina was nothing. The stuff that is so bad for us was no big deal to them. And it wasn't a big deal for their parents or their parents or their parents. It was just part of life. It was a gangster life. And when they walked away from all of it to come to Allah, did their family just say, oh, okay, you're Muslim now, congratulations? They went through all kinds of horrible experiences from their loved ones, from their society, from their peers, because they abandoned those crimes, isn't it? For some people, simply taking the shahada, simply walking away from the crime, from a criminal life, Simply getting away from zina is so huge. For those of you that have been brought up in respectable families, have been surrounded by a good environment, it's easy for you to not get into that kind of trouble. Or easier. Nowadays, anything's easy. But for those of you that, are, that came up, you weren't even Muslim, you saw crime all around you, you saw drugs all around you, you saw womanizing all around you, every, every weekend was at the club, and then you came to Allah, you took shahada, your journey away from that life is a huge journey. And Allah acknowledges it and says, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Some people have done that. They're, they're special just on that account. They don't know nothing else. They have no exhaustive knowledge, no exhaustive worship. But the fact that they can migrate, they make hijrah for the sake of Allah. They migrated away from those major sins towards Allah. Incredible. But the mercy of Allah in these ayat isn't done. First of all, those three things that I mentioned, shirk, and murder, you know, blasphemy with Allah, and murder and, and adultery are major, major sins. So what does Allah say? يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا Punishment will be doubled for such a person. And they'll remain in it, humiliated. These crimes are not small to Allah. Especially the three of them combined. But, by the way, the worst of all crimes, shirk, is in this ayah. The second worst of all crimes, when you kill one person, it is as though you've killed what? All of humanity. That's the second greatest crime. And then the third greatest crime is what? Zina. All three together in one ayah. Therefore Allah says, this person is going to get some special kind of punishment. And they will be in, in that punishment, humiliated, remaining therein. But even the worst of the worst of the worst. This guy is not the worst because he's done one thing. He's the worst because he's done how many? Three things. Three things. This is like, this is the hat trick of hellfire. And what does Allah say about him? He says, Except somebody who repented and came to their faith, came to faith, and from then on acted in a good way. I'll make an exception. This is important to understand. Allah described the worst of the worst of the worst. And then said, even of that person, if they come back to me, I will not throw them in punishment. But that's not enough. We are talking about Ibad ar-Rahman, being unimaginably merciful. So he won't just spare them from hell. What does he do? فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ then those people, Allah will replace their grand sins. And I remind you what their sins were. Shirk, inna shirka la gulmun azim. Murder, anna ma qatala nasa jami'a, as though he killed all of humanity. And zina, adultery. Major, major sins. 
Allah says, I will replace their entire mountain of evil with good deeds in their favor. They haven't done any good deeds yet. They haven't done any good deeds yet. They haven't prayed yet. They haven't worshipped yet. They haven't done hajj yet. They haven't given charity yet. All they've done is repented. And from now on, they're going to be do right. That is enough for Allah to take the mountains of sin that were going to get them into hell forever, humiliated, and convert those mountains of sin into mountains of good deeds. This is Allah for people of Tawbah. And you get to be special just through Tawbah. So as you're sitting there listening to this and thinking, well, I've made some pretty big mistakes. There may be somebody sitting in the audience that even committed murder and went to jail and then came out. How is Allah going to forgive me? Some of you have made the mistake of zina. May Allah protect you. Some of you are he heading down that path. Some of you have committed shirk. There's all kinds of crimes happening. Some people went into sihr, which is a kind of shirk. And if you can make tawbah and come back to Allah, all of that is gone. But you've got to keep straight after that. In other words, when you come back to Allah, it's got to be for real. You, it can't be artificial. And Allah has always been forgiving, extremely forgiving, always loving, caring, and merciful. I, I'm running out of time, but I, w I do want to share a couple more things with you that I, I find... Let's just finish this list, inshallah. It's, it's almost done. Somebody says, but I didn't do murder. I didn't do shirk. And I, I didn't do zina. I just did like little stuff, like I missed fajr. And, you know, I, I, I stole my brother's chocolate milk the other day from the fridge. Or I think there's a couple of times I lost my temper with my dad. Or I think I did some backbiting the other day at a party. But I didn't murder. I think... This is this Tawbah is for really bad criminals. What about me? What about regular sinners like the rest of us? <laughs> you know? Because this is high profile sinners, isn't it? So the next ayah says, as for the rest of you, taba, and whoever would make Tawbah, any kind of Tawbah, and did good. Then he's come back to Allah with a sincere repentance also. Allah acknowledges that too. Look, your Tawbah is good too. You don't have to, like, I'm going to first go rob a bank and then make tawbah. No, no, no. Because I need it to be like, mountains of evil converted to mountains of good. <laughs> no. Chill. Hey, hold on a second. Just make your tawbah. Whatever, whatever indulgence you're into. فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ And people who don't witness, literally says don't witness falsehood. What that means is they don't stand by when something wrong is happening. These people are special to Allah because when in their family somebody is being emotionally abused, somebody is being financially abused, in their family there's, a, there's two brothers went into a business and one of them took all the money and never paid the other one back and now they're in court fighting this, that, the other and you're related to the one, you're on one side and against the other side you will not stand quietly by and let injustice happen. You won't do it. Even if it's against your own dad. Even if it's against your own, you know, your own spouse or your own child. You can't stand idly by and stand for wrong. You'll speak up. And at least you won't be a silent partner to it. You'll walk away from it. I want nothing to do with this. I'm not going to be a part of it. You know? La yashhaduna zur. They don't, and the other meaning of it is they don't give false witness. They don't, not, you know, sometimes there's, there's pressure on you to side with people who are wrong. You know they're wrong, but they say things like family, family first, man. Or, you know, bros first. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And if you do that, if you have your loyalties in the wrong place, knowing that you're wrong, knowingly, then this is a violation of la yashhadun azur. The second piece of it, wa idha marru billaghwi marru kiraman, also amazing. What makes you amazing to Allah in this ayah? You're at, you're in a gathering, you know, friends are hanging out, or you're on a WhatsApp group or something. There are different kinds of interaction today, and in those interactions, people are talking nonsense. People are backbiting against each other. They're making fun of each other. They're wasting each other's time, and you don't want anything to do with this. So what do you do? 
You leave the group, but you don't give them a lecture first. By the way, this is all useless. You people are wasting your time. Astaghfirullah. I called you to Allah and to make tawbah. Watch the following video. But, and now I'm, I'm out of this group. No. Or you're at a party and you're like, Astaghfirullah, all y'all are doing ghibah. I'm out of here. You know, <laughs> no. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا When they pass by this kind of a gathering, when they happen to be in that kind of a situation, they get out of it in a dignified fashion. مَرُّوا كِرَامًا In other words, they maintain their own dignity. They don't end up falling into the kind of things that humiliate others and themselves. And in the process, they don't make anyone else feel bad either. They make a dignified, you know, respectable excuse and get themselves out of that situation. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا and finally, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا It's not finally, but I just said that to make you feel better. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا That's for everybody who attends Jum'ah. When they are reminded of the ayat of their Rabb, when they're given reminders, they don't trip over those reminders, deaf and blind. In other words, they don't ignore them. They don't take them lightly. They don't hear something and then say, yeah, that's talking about me. That hit me right here in my conscience, but I'm going to forget I heard that. I'm going to pretend that wasn't about me and not think about it. They're not deliberately deaf and they're not deliberately blind to the reminder that was given to them. It was about you. It was about what, what you're doing, what you're up to. And you're now, you can't deal with it because you don't want to change. But you know, human beings just want to just dive right into the things in front of them. The temptation is too strong. And Quran, you know, it's about ulin nuha, it's people who hold you back, the people that can hold themselves back. You're being reminded to hold yourself back, and you're like, I don't want to hold back, man. I felt pretty good. I already set up the, you know, the appointment, the date and time and place, and bought the tickets already and then the khutbah ruined my mood you know so I'm just gonna go eat a burger and not think about what I just heard in the khutbah and then go where I was gonna go because that's too late already for me you know they don't do that these are people when they hear a reminder they let let it impact them they let it change them that makes you special to Allah by the way sometimes that change that happens inside you nobody sees it Nobody knows the sin you were heading towards and nobody knows you changed course because you heard something from Allah. Nobody knows that. That's between you and Allah and Allah considers you from His ibad because you made that change. May Allah strengthen each and every one of you and myself to make those changes. So now, as we tie this up, this is actually the last one. These are people who are now not only concerned about themselves, they're concerned about their families. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ Those who pray to Allah, they say, they say to Allah, Master, grant us from our spouses and our children what's called the coolness of our eyes. Give us the coolness of our eyes. Which means two things. I'll, I'll skip the technicalities and give you the simple understanding of قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ The first one means, Ya Allah, everything else gives me stress. Everything else causes me trouble. But when I come to my spouse and I come to my children, Ya Allah, give me this, this place, I find my calm. All my troubles disappear when I look at my spouse. All of my troubles disappear when I'm with my children. Ya Allah, give me that in my wife and my kids. Or my husband and my kids for each side, you know. And then, the other meaning of it, Qurrat, comes from Qarar. Qarar means when your eyes stay somewhere. Ya Allah, make me so in love with my wife that I can't stop looking at her. Ya Allah, make me so in love with my children and so happy with my children that I don't compare them to others. I'm happy with what I have. I don't make them feel bad. I, I validate them. Grant me the ability to find qurrat a'yun in the spouse and in the child. Give me a strong family and make me content with my family. Make them a source of peace for my family. You know, for, all, for a lot of you, the only stress is wife and kids. You know? <laughs> this dua is, the only stress relief should be wife and kids. And you have to, you don't just ask Allah for something and not work on it. Because Allah will not 
like descend some kind of special rain that drenches on your family and now all of a sudden you love your wife. It takes work. It takes work to fix the relationship you have with your children. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you and I have to invest into. So may Allah grant us the ability to not only make that dua, but to live by that dua. Because Allah will ask us, you know, even in that famous dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab nar Famous dua, right? Give us the best in this life, the best in the next life. Protect us from the hellfire, the punishment of the hellfire. What do we say right after that? What does Allah say right after that? Ula'ika lahum nasibun bimma kasabu. They'll have the portion they actually earn. You don't just make dua and not work. You got to earn it. You got to put your work in. So when you're going to ask Allah to give you peace in your family, when you're going to be concerned about that, and by the way, what does that mean? Husbands that are hanging out until 2, 3 in the morning at some shisha place in London and not going home to their wife because they don't find content. The wife is not finding any contentment in them and they're not finding contentment in their wife when they say, no, no, bruv, I got to go back home. <laughs> then they're special to Allah. When they're, when they're spending time with their kids, their eyes aren't moving from their kids. The, the fact that your eyes aren't moving from your kids means you're actually with them. The fact that you're spending time with your kids and enjoying doing that is actually in and of itself making you special before Allah. This ulaika yujzawnal ghurfata bima sabaru. These people and make us imam over muttaqeen, make us leaders over righteous people. You know, give them a good righteous life so that when I stand in front of you, ya Allah, that I, you know, I'm my deeds are only increased by the people that are in my family. So now after all of this, ulaika yujzawnal ghurfata bima sabaru. Those are the people that are going to be given high, lofty palaces because of the, the patience they demonstrated. Notice Allah here says, because of the patience they de demonstrated. If you go back to this list, those who hold their tongue, when ignorant people talk to them, they, they, they're humble and they, they hold their tongue. Those who worship no one other than Allah, those who are, you know, they worship Allah in the middle of the night. The list that we just went through, each one of them requires perseverance and strength and grit and commitment. And that's the word sabr. Those people are going to be rewarded because of the commitment they showed. They were committed to this. This is ulaika yujzawna ghurfata bima sabaru wa yulaqawna fiha tahiyyatan wa salaman. And they're going to be met in those palaces in Jannah. They're going to be met with greetings and peace. Allah Azza wa Jal will send salutations to them. Not just that Allah loves them, Allah is honoring them now. These are specially awarded people by Allah. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا حَسُنَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا They will remain in that incredible honor and those incredible lofty high palaces. What, a, what a, an amazing place to be for a little while and forever. So Allah Azza wa Jal contrasting it with Jahannam, right? Jahannam he said, I don't want to be there for a little bit, I don't want to be there forever. Allah says, the taste, the taste of Jannah. If you could even have a little bit, you'd want it. What to speak of forever. May Allah Azza wa Jal enter all of us into Jannah forever. And so the last ayah, and this is, I, I know I'm going over my time. I'm supposed to give you guys some time for questions also, but I'll need seven, eight minutes maybe. This last ayah profound. This is the last ayah of the surah. And the last ayah of this entire passage. It has nothing to do with the list that makes you special. It's a turn back to the Quraysh and to all of humanity. And the Prophet is told now that they've been given this list of how to get close to God. What is the what is the problem? قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَا دُعَاؤُكُمْ فَقَدْ كَذَّبْتُمْ فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا There are several ways to look at this ayah. I want to share simply some of them with you. Because of the shortage of time, I won't go into the language. I'll just share the implications just in English. Allah is on the one hand saying, what weight do you have in front of Allah? What are you worth in front of Allah? What do you think when you come before Allah? What value will you have? Had it not been for the fact that you as human beings were given the responsibility that nobody else was given, du'a'ukum, you were to call on Allah. You were to make the choice to call on Allah. The mountain, the tree, the bird, they don't have a choice. They call on Allah anyway. You, why do you, why are you valuable to Allah if not for one thing? The fact that you were chosen to call on Him. But you've abandoned that responsibility. You consider that invitation to call on him a lie? 
فَسَوْفَ يَكُونُ لِزَامًا Then this is going to come and this, is, this, this punishment will not leave you. This is going to be something you won't be able to escape. That's the first implication. The other implication is Allah is telling the disbelievers and those who have been doing all the sins, you have no value before me. And the only reason you are still surviving is there are a few among you who still call me. There are still a few believers left on the earth who still make a step far to Allah. And they're the only reason you're still surviving. The third implication is Allah has no value, even for the kafir, and for the Muslim who is far away from Allah, he should listen to this, and she should listen to this too. Allah says, what value do I have of you? You don't pray, you don't obey, you don't stay with the halal, you violate everything. But in moments of desperation, you still call me, and I still value at least that much about you. I'm still giving you a chance. لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ But you've, overall, you've still considered everything else valueless. You don't give, you don't confirm that everything else that I've given you and asked you to do is actually meaningful for you. You consider all of the rest of it useless, a lie. And you better change your ways because soon this will become a permanently sticking punishment. Allah doesn't say you will be punished. He says soon you'll be punished. Soon you won't be able to escape it, meaning right now you, you still have a chance. Turn around. Then an implication. What would make you people Quraysh valuable had it not been that Allah has called you with the Qur'an? Allah has honored you with this book. And by extension, Allah has honored you and me with this Qur'an. And yet you dismiss it altogether? You don't care for this book? This message that Allah gave me? You better turn, turn, turn back and recognize the value of Allah choosing to speak to you. The final implication is that Allah Azza wa Jal does not want to punish you. Ma bikum, implication, another linguistic implication of it is, Allah is not interested in punishing you. He has no desire and no intention of punishing you, except the crimes you've committed of calling someone other than Allah are so huge that that needs to be punished. In other words, Allah is punishing you even though He doesn't want to. مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ Allah gets nothing out of punishing you. What is Allah going to get out of punishing you? Allah is saying here, I don't want to punish you, but your crimes are too, too big. So, and soon, that will become permanent. Right now it's temporary, you can erase it. So please turn back. Turn back to Allah. After giving us all these opportunities to not just come back to Him, but be the closest to Him, Finally, he says, why do you want to get punished? I don't want to punish you. Just come back. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us internalize that in our hearts and make us of those who because of whom the people around you that are in sin, the people around you that are disobeying Allah, they all, their hearts also soften and they come back towards Allah Azza wa Jal as well. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All right, so I'll, I'll start with the most fun question. What's the halal way of approaching a girl you like? <laughs> Even though that's question number 12, I thought, you know. Um, so uh, this is more complicated. We've, we've made it more complicated than uh, the Sahaba. So the Sahaba were simple people, and they came from a very rebellious society where men and women did all kinds of things and nobody cared. And then Islam came. And I want to give you some background here. You know, in, in Medina, when the Sahaba migrated, the Muhajirun were bankrupt nearly, right? They left everything behind. And Medina was a crazy place. Right now it's Medina Munawwara. But Medina back then was Las Vegas. It was bad. When the Prophet went there, so them, it was not a good place. Okay, you have to understand, it was a crazy, crazy society. For instance, one of the most common industries in the city of Medina was prostitution. When the Prophet moved there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the women that were, they were brothels, like prostitution houses, they used to have flags outside their house. That this is a place you can come for those kinds of things. And a companion comes to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and says, Ya Rasulullah, uh, there's a woman, because he doesn't make any money, he's a muhajir. There's a woman, she makes good money, I'd like to marry her. And what, what does she do? Oh, well, you know, she's in the... You know what I'm saying? 
I'm not going to smell it out. And those, you know why I'm telling you this? Because Sahaba didn't even know that's a bad thing yet. They were also learning, weren't they? They didn't become angels overnight. They were being developed. And so he doesn't even think. And imagine you come to Rasulullah and ask this question. Can you imagine somebody coming to a, an imam today and saying, hey, so uh, I'm thinking about <laughs> <laughs> the next janazah would be of the shaykh. Like, it would be <laughs> and then the ayat came, no, you cannot marry those kinds of women in Surah An-Nur. Like, revelation came to teach Sahaba and teach the believers, look, those are not the kinds of people you want to marry. They are their own. You know, don't mix with them. You know, like Ibn, Ab Ibn Ashur says, Rahmahullah, uh, in his tafsir, that ayah is referring to professional prostitutes, that the zani will not marry a zani. is referring to them because the question was actually raised. I wanted to bring this up to you because for them, you would think that, you know, if, if the Sahabi saw a woman from a mile away, he went the other way and made istighfar the whole night. No, it wasn't like that. They interacted with each other, they talked to each other, they worked with each other, they were in business partnerships. All kinds of interactions happened between men and women, but with principle. It was respectful, it was dignified. And when a companion, when, when somebody liked somebody else, you know what they did? Here's the astaghfirullah part. Here's what they did. Hey, I like you. You want to get married? And she'd say, um, maybe, talk to my dad. He'd say, okay. And then you'd go to the dad and say, hey, I, I like your daughter. And she's, I mean, I talked to her. She's not entirely opposed to the idea. Is it cool? And he says, let me talk to my daughter. How this happens today in London is you go to a girl, Respectfully, hey, we, we worked together for three years. Would you consider marrying me? And she's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and maybe she says, please don't talk to my dad, he'll kill me. <laughs> because if you talk to my dad, he'll say, this is why you go to work? <laughs> this is why we sent you to uni? <laughs> like, you fathers, I have four daughters. I have four daughters. Listen, th those of you that are fathers, that have daughters, you sent your daughters to university. You brought your daughters to this country. You made them live here. You, brought, you took them outside in society. You made that decision. And when somebody like a Muslim likes them, that's a good thing. How are they going to get married sitting at home? Who's going to like them? So when somebody approaches them in a respectful way, you should not say, oh my God, the day has come, astaghfirullah. <laughs> you know, ye din bhi dekhne the, oh, taba taba. You know, what a humiliation. Now we have to go take you back into Bangladesh and hide you in a village somewhere because <laughs> some guy likes you. Astaghfirullah. You know, and there's the, you know, somebody's in ruqya on her and calm down. It's okay. You're, somebody likes your daughter, that's a good thing. Now you go and investigate, find out. It's completely fine. The only rishta mentioned in the Quran, the only approach mentioned in the Quran is that of Musa alayhi salam in Madian. He was by himself, Musa was by himself. And these girls were by themselves working outside. And he went up to them and helped them out. And the girl said, he's kind of nice. And she, she went back to her dad and said, hire him. Which means, come on dad, <laughs> you know. And that happened, and the girl said, I like the guy. That's actually what happened in the story of Musa. Musa didn't propose, the girl proposed. And the father can't propose unless he has the approval of his daughter. So it's okay for your girls to say, Dad, there's this guy, this brother, at the MSA, yeah? <laughs> uh, he does the, he's a Thursday halakha. It's really good, you should come. Your daughter's telling you something. It's okay, go attend the halakha. It's okay, find out. Don't complicate this. There's nothing indignified about that. Don't go date a girl now. And don't take, oh, son, no man gave a lecture, I'm gonna take you out to dinner. No, no, no. Not that either. But can you have respectful interaction with someone you're interested in for marriage? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Can you take your time to understand each other's likes and dislikes? Yes, it's fine. Respectful courtship is okay. With parental guidance, with dig in, in dignified fashion, there's nothing wrong with it. So what happens is we have two extremes. We have people that are more conservative than the Sahaba. And then we have people that are more liberal than liberals. Okay, and the Islam is right in between. It's a natural way. It's a completely natural way. Okay, 
And so th this is something that I thought it's important to mention for families and for yourself. Talk to your daughters. Ask if they like someone. Don't create a, between fathers and daughters, there should be open communication. They should not be terrified to tell you that they're interested in somebody. Don't force them to marry someone they don't want to. Don't force your daughters to, and, and tell them, if you don't marry this one, who's going to come and marry you? And you have to, we already said yes to them. Don't humiliate the family and say no now. Those kinds of nikahs are haram. I will say it, they're haram. You cannot emotionally and psychologically force a girl to get married under family pressure. That is batil. And that happened at the time of the Prophet And the Prophet considered those nikahs batil. They're, they're invalid nikahs. Until the girl genuinely likes a guy and says, yes, I want to marry him on her own. From no pressure from her father, no pressure from her mother, no pressure from anybody else. She likes him. And even if the day of the nikah, she says, mom, I don't want to do this. The mother doesn't say, too late, girl, too late. We've got the hall, they're all, what are people going to, no. If the girl says, I don't want to do this, then no, stop. Allah gave her that right. You cannot take it away. You're burying them alive. This is the new way of burying women alive, by the way. Back then, they used to take the baby girl and bury her right then. Now we bury them at the day of the nikah. This is what we do. This needs to stop. Let them marry who they want. If they're a dignified Muslim. And because now you're living in a different society, you won't find someone from the same village. It's okay. It's okay. A Bangladeshi can marry a Syrian. It's fine. I know. It's okay for Syrians too. Yeah. You, Syria. Turkish. Somali. Astaghfirullah, Somali. Yes, yeah, Somali. It's fine. <laughs> you know? You know, Musa alayhi salam is an Arab. Musa is an Arab. Or, or, or actually not an Arab. He's from is he an Israelite. And he married an Arab. He went and married in Madian, didn't he? So many Arabs, uh, we only marry Arabs. Really? Musa alayhi salam was actually from Israel. What's up with that? You know? It's all good. You, you, so it's, it's, it's a time now, it's a strange time that we live in. And actually the only thing that can save us is the basic principles of our deen. And getting, facilit making the path to marriage easy is actually one of the greatest battles against shaitan. When we make the path to marriage difficult, when you have 28, 30, 30, I'm not going to do other questions, forget it. Let's just talk about this. What am I going to do? We're going to have 35-year-old boys not married. You, what do you think? They were doing tahajjud for 35 years? <laughs> what planet do you live on? They didn't do anything haram? No evil thoughts went in their head? They didn't go to university? They didn't go to work? 28, 29 year olds not being married? This is ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And we, we create standards that don't exist in our, in our religion and don't make any sense. You have three daughters, four daughters, somebody proposed for the younger daughter, and no proposal came for the older daughter. No, 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 we go in order. <laughs> Who said you go in order? Which sharia? If there's a good blessing that came to your home for whichever age, why would you deny it? What will people say? What will Allah say when you explain yourself to Him and say, I deprived my daughter of a good nikah, because it wasn't in order. What will you say to Allah? You tell me that. What are you going to do? Ridiculous. This nonsense needs to stop. Marriage needs to be made easy. And the guy's side, because Hindu tradition says, the guy is the gift. So the girl's side has to give him gifts. Islam came and said, the man has to give what? Maha. The man has to give a gift. The woman is a gift to the family. And now we do in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia. No, no, no. We don't want jahez. We don't want gifts from the girl's side. But there should be something. At least a fridge. You know? <laughs> that, that is the opposite of what Allah commanded. That is the opposite of what Allah commanded. You're not only disobeying Allah, you're reversing what Allah said. Asking to pay, to be gifted, because you're the girl, you know, the, the, the guy's side? That's like way beyond haram. I don't even know what the category that belongs in. Shaitan is giving you like five stars for that one. <laughs> do, like, do not fall into that category. Don't give your daughter-in-laws and your wives gifts and then ask for them back. 
Now this is happening. They'll give them jewelry at the wedding. No, that was just for the photos. <laughs> really? Allah Azza wa Jal will describe this. You know, لا تأخذ منه شيئاً أتأخذونه بهتاناً وإثماً مبيناً Don't take a single thing from the spouse that you've given to them. Are you taking a huge accusation against your own self and taking clear sin on yourself when you agree to a mahr? You know, nowadays this, the, the fashion is they don't discuss the mahr until the day of the nikah or the minute of the nikah. Before then, when the mahr comes up, they say, oh, it's family, it's okay, we'll work it out, it's okay. And then the time comes, and then the girl says, 50,000. <laughs> and they're like, oh, the guy was poor guy was eating biryani and gets stuck in his, you know, <laughs> like, 50,000? And then his uncle whispers in his ear, it's okay, nobody pays it. <laughs> if you have no intentions of paying mahr, your nikah has been valid. If you have intentions of asking your wife to forgive the mahr, you're committing a grave sin. You can't even ask for a discount. You cannot, you're not allowed. You can't, and you can't give it when, you know, you decide. She decides when it's given. That's her right. That's what validates the marriage. Don't agree to a mahar you can't afford. Don't agree to a mahar you, can't, you have no intention of paying. Don't agree to a mahar that you intend to get forgiven. Oh, if you loved me, you would have forgiven it. Why, do you, why, why does money have to prove that I love you? Because it's mahar. And because you can't use that kind of language. If they, out of their own free will, out of the goodness of their own heart, decide to give you some of it, like you gave the, the, you know, the thousand for the month to her of the mahar, and she says, here's, here's two pounds, get yourself an ice cream. That's up to her. If she wants to do that, she can do that. But you cannot. That's not your money. That is not your money. These things, why am I highlighting these random things? These are the things that we have introduced into the institution of marriage, making marriage difficult. And when you make marriage difficult, the door to zina is wide open. The door to corruption is wide open. Our, it's unnatural to think that an 18 year old, 19, 20 year old guy, girl, are going to be in university and they're going to be there for five, six years and not develop any emotional attachments. And then for them to randomly marry a cousin back in Lahore. That's not going to happen. And if it does happen, it's a form of oppression because she's emotionally attached to somebody else and no man wants to be with a woman who's emotionally attached to somebody else or vice versa. It's oppression. Sometimes you're denying a nikah only because it wasn't you. You didn't come up with it. The guy says, I like the girl. No, you will, pick, you will marry who we say. Why? Who said? It's a mistake. I don't like it. I don't like that girl. That's not your problem. That's his problem. He's an adult now. Let him make that mistake. If it's a horrible mistake, so be it. But Allah gave those young men and women the right to pick who they want. Parents can give advice, yes. But when you try to control what your children are doing, it will only lead to disaster. It will only, only lead to disaster. I'm not giving license to 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds who say, well, it's not that I can marry whoever I want. No. <laughs> I'm talking about mature adults. I mean, I've met young women that are 25, 26 year old, accomplished in their careers, pharmacists, physicians, you name it, and they, they like somebody and they want to marry them, family says no. That is absolutely zulm. Nothing else can describe it. That is zulm. If a woman says she wants to marry someone and he's a Muslim, there's no reason for you to stop it. You have no right as a family to stop it. This is wrong of you to do. You're abusing a right that Allah gave you, abusing it. It should, it should not happen. And for young men, the last bit of advice is for young men, become men, earn a living, be dignified. Don't offer like dates for mahar. Well, Sahaba used to give, what, in, what other thing are you a Sahabi? <laughs> other than the Kit Kat you want to give for mahar. You know? <laughs> no. Be dignified. You know, earn, earn a decent living for yourself. Don't say, I, I like her, I don't have a job, but I don't know, they're only, her family is only interested in dunya. Yeah, that's why we have mahar. Only interested in dunya. You're supposed to be concerned about dunya too. Wala tansa nasiba kamina dunya. It's in the Quran. Don't forget the portion you are owed in this life. It's a worldly decision too. It's not just a spiritual decision. How is, how is somebody going to provide for my daughter? Where is she going to live? Is she going to live a decent life? 
These are respectable questions. These are decent questions. So these things we have to take very, very seriously in our communities. And it, when it comes to the subject of marriage, I didn't talk today about what happens after marriage, because there's a whole set of dhulm we do after marriage. That for another time. I'll yell at you another time. But right now, let's just fix, fix the institution itself. Let's make marriage easy for our young people, especially the ones that are ready and capable. You know, Whoever among you is capable, let them get married. Capability, if capability is there, no other barrier should be there. And for those of you that will find this controversial, it's okay, I'm leaving here anyway soon, so that you, you deal with it and troll me on, the, on, on, the, on online. So I'll tell you, if, you know, your, if your son wants to marry somebody who just took shahada yesterday, right, or the girl wants to marry a guy who just became Muslim a week ago or something, and then you say, well, he only became Muslim because he wants to marry the girl. It's not a real shahada. Who decides what a real shahada is? Who decides? Can you tell why something happened? When Osama, you know, the, the famous narration of Osama came, that he was about to kill someone in battle. In battle, he's about to kill someone. And the guy falls. Loses, the enemy loses his sword. And he's about to strike him down. And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He took shahada, became Muslim. Did he become Muslim? Because when he fell down, it hit him really hard on the head, and all of a sudden Islam started making sense. And he's like, hold on a second, I think this, we need to stop this and I'm ready to be Muslim now. Obviously he took shahada because he knows Muslims don't kill each other. So he took advantage of the opportunity because he's losing. If he was the one on top, he wouldn't have taken shahada, would he? So he's on the bottom and he takes shahada. And Osama sees it and says, yeah, right. <laughs> he killed him. And when that happens, this news reaches the Prophet Did he? Is it obvious, like 1,000% the guy took shahada for the wrong reason? It's obvious to anybody who sees it. The Prophet says, what will you do when that la ilaha illallah comes for you on judgment day? That's what the Prophet says. That shahada will complain on judgment day, I wasn't respected. And that's in the most obvious of cases. When somebody says they've taken shahada, who are you to question their reason? That's between them and Allah. It's okay. As a matter of fact, even among the Sahaba, there were those, somebody said, I want to marry you, and the, 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 the woman was a Muslim, and the guy was a non-Muslim. And she said, you're not Muslim. He goes, okay, I'll become Muslim. She says, okay, fine. I need to be Muslim. And they got married. Done. But you could say, Astaghfirullah, he married, he took shahada for a woman. Yeah, but the Prophet was okay with it. Why are you having a problem with it? The sunnah is okay. You're more Sunni than the sunnah. <laughs> you know? So what you need to do now, what you and I need to do, is understand that we are in a challenging time. And our children are exposed to the, the, the worst kinds of haram are no big deal now. They're accessible, they're easy, and they're not hard to, to fall into. And in that environment, when the opportunity for nikah is there, please, it is a grave crime for us to deny that opportunity. To, to consider, of course, give your children advice. I think this is a bad nikah for this reason, this reason, this reason, but the decision is yours. The decision is yours. You have to share sincere advice, and dinun nasiha. You do. But at the end of the day, they'll have to make their decision. And if it was a bad decision, so be it. It's, that's okay too. That's their, their mistake to make. That's a better mistake than the mistakes they will make outside of marriage. You understand that, right? And that you won't even know about. And you'll tell yourself, no, 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 my son, my daughter, they would never. Really? Really? Because you come from like an angel family? Your son and daughters don't have hormones? They don't have emotions? They don't have attachments? They don't have obsessions? They don't have temptations? They do. Don't be deluded into thinking you're... He's a good boy, though. He prays. Yeah, what is prayer going to do? What is prayer? If you say, that works to an extent. But Allah created us with a fitra. You're denying that fitra. So this, I know I went on a rant, but I, I felt like I had to do it. May Allah Azza wa Jal make marriages easy for our community and bless the marriages that are happening. May Allah Azza wa Jal give the, the, the husbands the strength of character and the understanding to be good husbands and the wives the kind of commitment, loyalty, and understanding to be good wives and thus raise wonderful families. That's the end of the question and answer session. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Allah